Hello everyone, I am Dhruv from grade 9 and I will be emceeing the sessions in Kahani Manch this afternoon and evening. And I'm Alicia from grade 10, I will be the second MC for this afternoon and evening. So our next topic will be, are schools using AI effectively? How are libraries a key player in this vast topic? I have so many questions about this new advancement of artificial intelligence. It's something so new and abstract, how does it impact us? I totally get you. I have so many questions too. I'm so excited that we get to listen to experts in this field and understand this new topic much further. Our first session will be with Katie Day and Nadine Bailey, focusing on how librarians are leading global, at lo, at leading global schools are harnessing the power of AI. Katie Day is the head of libraries at UWCSCA Dover. Nadine Bailey is a middle school librarian at the American School of Dubai. Now without further ado, let's dive into this up and coming world of AI and learn something new about it today. We invite you to the stage. Okay, um, the first thing we'll say is that this same slide will go up at the very end and we really, really, really want you to take the QR code or take the short URL and go back into the slides later. Uh, we are true librarians. We've curated a lot of material for you and it's <laughs> like something like 60 slides and we might be going fast, but we, if you go back yourself and there are links on every single page, on every single slide. So no excuse for you not delving in deeper. Okay, so uh, both Katie and I love analogies and this is what we decided our real title of our um, presentation was going to be, which is Tame the horsey, Horses and Train the Jockeys because um, what we're seeing is um, our students are out of the gate and running wild and they're trying out AI and they're using AI and the teachers are kind of standing back and like, oh my gosh, what, what must we do with this? And the admin standing back and saying, oh, this is all happening and they're all cheating and it's all so awful. So that's, that's our analogy um, for what we're going to talk to about today. So a few considerations. These are the three topics we're going to address today. AI to enhance human learning, AI for the teacher and librarian, and a few cautionary and optimistic tales. Okay, so um, we're both very informed by a course that is being run by Barbara Oakley, and what she says is basically learning is hard. It's a really hard thing. We put kids through 12 years of compulsory education. Why do we take them out of employment, they don't have to be at home working for us, because that process of learning takes a lot of time, it takes 12 years. Okay. Um, and what has to happen is all the things we say, all the concepts, all the skills have to go from short term or working memory into long term memory, so that things are automatic. So think back when you were learning to drive a car, how hard it was and then how once it became automatic, it became earlier. And learning with AI, how AI can help you is not by doing things for you, it's by helping you put things from short-term into long-term memory. So um, these, uh, Barbara Oakley is, um, runs some, they're free Coursera courses. So they're free online, but if you want to do some of the exercises at the end, it might be like a 50 US dollar charge. Um, and her most famous one is here on the left, started in 2014, The Science of Learning. It's one of the most subscribed courses on Coursera. And now she just released, just last week, a new one on Accelerate Your Learning with ChatGPT. And she's been doing kind of the rounds of talking about it. So she came to Singapore and gave this talk, Using Generative AI to Strengthen and Speed Learning. And it wasn't filmed in Singapore, but then she went right, right to Bangkok the next week and filmed. And so one of the universities has put it up online. So watch that talk, it's wonderful. And then she does do these books and like that learning how to learn. Um, the center book there is a book for, um, uh, yeah. for like junior high, high school students. Now, um, so one of the things they talk, you know, she talks about and metaphors. So 
Um, Nadine and I, we love analogies, we love metaphors, and this is just an example of one of our favorite metaphors as teacher librarians, and that you ask kids. You can ask kids who are five years old, how is information like, like fruit? And you put up a picture of an apple. And I tell you, the kids will have so many, I do this with high schoolers, and I'll say, I get better answers out of five-year-olds. Come on, guys, tell me, how is information like fruit? And it's, you know, it's good for you. It plants seeds of knowledge in your brain. It can go rotten, right, and can get out of date. And for the, for the older kids, when we talk about summarizing and paraphrasing to make this, this analogy or metaphor to say it's the, all the flavors, it's all the ingredients, and you have to have everything in your bibliography, but we don't want to see any lumps of text or else you have to quote it. So um, thinking of AI, you, one of the first places to start the conversation in your school would be to say, what do you think AI is? And come up with metaphors and keep working on the metaphors until you get one that you think is, is useful for your situation. And then this is just, again, this is a great article. We really want you to go back and read all these articles that we loved. Um, and this is a researcher at the Center for Future Intelligence at the University of Cambridge and, and saying that myths and metaphors aren't just rhetorical flourishes. They are about power. They tell us who has it, who should have it, how they should use it, and in the service of what goal. By actively choosing myths and metaphors that perpetuate a healthy, collaborative, ethical, and accountable understanding of AI, we can help ordinary people better understand how this technology works and how it should be used. Okay, yeah. So turn and talk with whoever's next to you and think of something, a metaphor that you would use to explain AI to somebody who doesn't know what it is. Turn heads. <laughs> Okay, so we are going to put up some that you might have. Did anybody t say it was a helpful friend? Did anybody say it was an unreliable friend? An assistant? Do you think it's an expert? Do you think it's as good as a tutor? How about a, me a mechanical psychic? A bicycle for the mind. I really like that one. A teammate, a clueless intern, a cute hapless robot, a toy, a pet, magic. So the link there is down to, um, these are first year university writing um, professors who wrote an article of metaphors that they have used with their students. So this is like, a, this is our favorite one of saying that when you ask, if you ask students to do a project, a writing project, a research project, you could say it's like saying, why don't you put on a pizza dinner? Why don't you make pizza for the family? Now, how much are they gonna, how are they gonna, are they just gonna go out and buy it? Right? You're just going to like, have AI write you a whole essay, and you, that's the equivalent of going out or paying a tutor. Because remember, AI, the threat of AI doing work for students is no different than them just paying somebody, paying a human being to write a paper for them. You, that's, that happens all the time. It happened before AI. But you, if you said to make pizza, are you going to make your own sauce? Are you going to grow your own tomatoes? Are you going to make the dough rise? You're just going to go out and buy like a frozen um, you know, piece of dough? Or... So the amount of help and when somebody puts something on, you always need to ask, how much have you really done yourself? And you could also talk about AI text generation, like you have real meat and then you have impossible meat. And in Singapore, you actually can buy lab-grown meat now. But they have found that the lab-grown meat is like has 5% of the actual meat cells in it and it's not commercially viable at the moment. But it's still, just to say, just like all this text is, is new and different to us, then we have all these new and different food things. Okay, and, and I just love the um, French expression, plus ça change. Um, there is nothing new under the sun, and AI is, I just think, starting from cuneiform and writing and the Greeks growing crazy about students not being able to learn because they couldn't memorize. This is just another iteration. So in 2016, 
um, cult of pedagogy, they did this art, this thing about, is your lesson a Grecian urn? And this is when, in response to, and I'm sure you've done it yourselves, I know I have, I'm sure you've seen other educators do it. You just, a magic, amazing project and they're all making beautiful Grecian urns and they've learned nothing except that it really sucks to be making paper mache when the climate's very humid. Um, and Understanding by Design, fantastic book, and he calls it the sin of activity oriented design. It's where you do busy work with the kids, everyone has fun, and it leads nowhere intellectually, and there's zero learning at the end. Okay, so fast forward to 2024, and here's a great article by Benjamin um, Riley. Riley. And he basically takes the Chicago school's um, guidance on AI. So they've just this lovely, thick, beautifully designed, illustrated handbook for each subject, telling them how they can use AI in their subject. And he goes through this and he basically says it's a lot of nonsense. Um, he says things go between irrelevant to actually really bad if you do it. Um, and he quotes some other... Um, educators and he says it's not doing any pedagogical work and it's actually bad because it displaces activities where they may actually be thinking and learning new content with pointless exercises so that's just a little warning nothing's changed um, back to the um, <laughs> metaphors stumbling in the dark library and we love this because we are librarians so what we're seeing with students is it's going to re revolutionize education. And then you watch kids trying to type in prompts or even educators trying to do something. And it's really um, stumbling in the world's largest library in the dark without a torch, a librarian, or even the Dewey Decimal System to help out. So <laughs> that's a cry for um, educate yourselves. So don't be that person. AI for teachers and librarians. So I think because it all seems so nice and chatty when you're with Ch ChatGPT, although I would challenge you to use the chatbot of a, an airline or a mobile phone provider, and then you won't have that nice fuzzy feeling anymore. Um, they do not have any intelligence. They have the semblance of intelligence, right? Um, this is a great thing. It's actually by a marketing guy, and I love this idea. Are we too impatient to be intelligent? And there's the slow movement, slow food and slow travel and slow this and that. And I'm trying to encourage the educators in my school to slow down with research, to do less and to spend more time and to go back to physical copies of books and to embed the skills that they need before we fly to skimming and scamming online and um, using chat GPT and all this kind of thing. And this is it. There are things in life where the value is precisely in the inefficiency, in the time spent, in the pain endured, in the effort you have to invest. And I know what I'm talking about because I tried to learn Chinese. And <laughs> it is painful, it is slow, but it's an amazing feeling. We're gonna come back to language a little bit later. So there's a great video and a great article there. And then this was just a, a quote again on the same theme that we loved to say, if Google search is an imperfect book index telling us where to find the material we need, AI is spark notes allowing us to bypass the source material altogether. And that thing of, yes, there may be times when uh, an AI tool can summarize a very difficult article to give you some sense of whether you really need to read this more carefully. But when it comes to reading books, well-written books, why would, you, why would you try to shortchange the experience? It's the journey, not the arrival. And again, that summar summaries and cheat sheets don't engage the emotions. They don't promote empathy or serendipitous discoveries. Someone recently, the other week um, online, uh, quoted, was referring to this book, Range, which I hope you have heard of. It's a, it's a very good book, talking about generalists, and generalists, generalists will own the future. And saying, Chad, 
AI tools can be like having 10,000 PhDs at your fingertips. And that is, there's a benefit to that, but they still may not have enough of the broad knowledge to come up with novel solutions. And then this is um, another, this is a new book that's come out, Leslie Valiant, a computer scientist, and gets into what, is it, what does it mean to be educable? So is a program educable? And, and we liked this, reading widely about things that don't seem immediately or practically useful, i.e. a human activity, in the hope that what you, may, what you learn now may prove meaningful later, that's pretty much the definition of a liberal arts education. So the benefit, the value of doing that. That article, um, I think the article's better than a book, to be honest. So if you want a short topic, you can read the article. Yeah, yeah that's true. It, it, the, the book is kind of heavy-duty computer, computer science. I'm going to definitely give it to my you know, high school computer science head. I'm not sure how many teenagers are going to get through it. But, um, and then this, Naomi S. Barron, she's a professor, and she, um, who wrote this? How AI and the lure, the lure of efficiency threaten human writing, and she asked some very good questions about what is the motivation for writing, and writing is thinking, and, uh, and what about authorship, and so she asks a lot of really good questions. I've, I very much like her. Okay, now my favorite area is language learning. So this is another turn and talk. So we have on the one hand, we have tools, AI tools included, that can help you learn language. And on the other hand, why bother if you can have a translation bot? And so what I want you to do with your partner is each of you take one side, one takes language learning, and one takes translation tools, and just say words that it makes you think of. So when you think of language learning or acquiring a language, give one partner give a bunch of words around that, and the other bot partner gives words around translation tools. Turn and talk. Okay, so um, we threw this into our little group this morning and talking about, I just put a few up around learning language and it was about connection, vulnerability, communication, humanity, the gift and challenge of language, effort, respect, identity, expression of emotion. And when we talked about translation, it was about ease of use, uh, fast, quick, um, getting things done. So there were a lot of very intellectual things around the um, translation tools and a lot of emotional, and people were very emotional about talking about their language journeys. So just here's a few things about the benefits of learning language. Okay, so what tools and shortcuts are legitimate for students to use? This I love. How many parents here or students are trying to get into a really competitive university? Come on, be honest. <laughs> be honest. Okay. So I read this article and I was, you have got to be kidding me. So basically what's happening in Harvard, which have really dumb professional, uh, professors and really stupid people who go there, is that students would rather ask a chatbot or chat GPT a question than go to their professors who know a huge amount of this information. So I just thought this absolutely fascinating that nearly 90% of the students use or um, actually subscribe to the premium subscriptions and they feel it doesn't, it, it ameliorates the need for them to actually go to the professors and ask for help, which I, I, I just find that stunning. Okay. So um, I always, when, when talking about AI, um, like to 
make people be aware of it to distinguish between the types of tasks you can ask it, where you're diverging, you're asking it to generate text, an open-ended question. And then there's some very good tools that are more converging. You're, you're handing it a PDF and asking it to analyze the data within. And so when we get into the thing of the hallucinations and the ways that it's unreliable, tools that you submit text and you ask it to analyze can, can be more useful. And it's just to be aware which are which. So then we get into like the, the, you know, and you sit around in a staff room or in an educational setting and say to people, you know, what do you think of AI? And, uh, and one reaction is, they're all cheating. They're cheating. So we're now going to, you know, lock them in a room with a pen and paper and make sure that we know what they're doing. Then you also can say to teachers, oh, it's, you know, your problem. You just have to change the assessment and make it so you can't cheat with, with AI, right? Or you could just be that ostrich down there saying, oops, nothing is happening. We don't have to worry about it. Okay. So, I mean, even before this, there were waves of panic, right? Starting with um, writing and the Greeks, and then we have the printing press in Gutenberg, and every time there's been this kind of techno um, panic. So... Looking at 1975 with calculators, nobody's ever going to learn math again, right? We don't need that, we've got the calculator. And then Wikipedia, uh, we don't need books and we don't need encyclopedias and we don't need databases. And then now ChatGPT. And each time we found a response, right? Uh, does anyone remember? I, I was in school in 1975 when calculators came out. And what happened? You couldn't just write down the answer, even if you knew it, even if you got it without using a calculator. You had to show all your workings. And you wouldn't get points unless you showed every step of the way what your thinking had been. Um, Wikipedia, there's a famous saying in schools, you can use Wikipedia to start your research. You shouldn't end it with that. You should be then looking around and you should be finding other sources for that. ChatGPT, there's some stuff around on assessment practices. There's a lot of bad stuff around. That's why we still said it's a work in progress. So um, they say, I say is a, a very common thing when, when talking to students about writing research papers. Every, every sentence, the reader should know whether you're saying it or the people that you're, you're citing uh, is saying it. And now we come up with they say, I say, it says. And it's still very unclear how we are going to ask students to, um, to show if something has come out of an AI-generated summary or information, how to reference it. And because uh, I even had a student come the other day and he was using uh, Copilot inside of Microsoft. So it's the type of AI generation where it does give you sources. So he put in a question and it gave him three sources. And his question was, he was writing about solar farms and he says, I want to know out of what percent of land that a solar farm is on, what percent are just the solar panels and how much extra land do you need for the rows and the batteries and the you know, the guardhouse or whatever. And he put it in, and, and we worked on the question, and it came back with it, and it gave us three sources. But when we clicked on those sources, it, there was nowhere, nowhere evident of how, how they had come up with that number, that, that acreage of land. So it's not foolproof. I mean, it, it can, you know, it'll get better, I suppose, but... Um, and then this is um, Leon Furs. At the end, we'll also be um, giving you some links and people that we follow. And he's uh, doing his PhD. He's an Australian. He's very prolific. He's a good blog. He's on LinkedIn. And so he's working with other academics. And this was their first to say that you'll have an assessment scale and be able to tell students what you can use AI for. So that was the April 2023. And then they've just come out with this one, 2024. So it's a five-stage from no AI to AI exploration and giving kids some guidance as to um, how much AI they can use. So this one, this is an article um, in the New Yorker at the end of August, does AI really encourage cheating in schools? And it says it's, 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 school isn't about creating new scholarship or answering questions correctly, it's about teaching proper work habits. Again, doing the work yourself. Setting aside the obvious offense of dishonesty, the problem with cheating isn't so much that the student skips over the process of explaining what they learned, it's that they deprive themselves of the time-consuming labor of actually having read the book, 
type out the sentences, and think through the prompt. Okay, so back to the convergent and divergent. When can you use AI? Or if your teacher says you couldn't, can't, or your school, before you start for brainstorming background information, during finding the experts, there are very specific research um, tools, AI tools, not chat GPT, who will help you find experts and papers, um, help you with repetitive tasks. I did a survey and I got so much data back from students and um, along with our tech expert, we used little, um, <laughs> what do I want to say, little routines to get all the information from the students which we wanted to be verbal but we wanted to code it. So we used AI for that, uh, for the processing. And of course translation, you're not expected to know every language in the world to be able to access things. And then at the end, and this is already, this has been prevalent forever, using Grammarly, using spell checker, grammar check, um, creating presentations. Uh, most schools now use Canva to create really pretty things, um, make nice graphics. So ideas versus content versus form. Um, so the question is now where we are with our horses galloping a mile away, we kind of now have to rein them in and tame them and treat, teach them how to trot, canter, gallop, jump over water barriers and all the rest. Um, and we've been looking really hard to see who's out there creating fa frameworks within which we can teach literacy in AI. So we have information literacy and literacy literacy and technical literacy. So this is one of the ones that we found that I thought was actually really good because it goes through the affective, which is how you feel about things. Um, the things you need to learn in terms of behavior, the cognitive learning, knowing, understanding, creating, and very important, the ethical understanding of AI. And so in, in going back to exactly understanding how it works, this, um, um, Stephen Wolfram of Wolfram Alpha, uh, you know, huge mathematician, mathematical software, uh, this is his explanation of the prediction. You know, the best thing about AI is its ability to, and then you come up with which word is most likely to come back. This is just another um, visual to show how the unhinged nature of the fact that AI is only reading about the world, it's not experiencing the world. And I liked this recently. This is uh, to... Uh, uh, the London uh, City University London Business School came out with an article, and they're talking about bullshit versus bot shit, right? And just to be aware, and, and what the dangers are of beware, how to manage the epistemic risks of generative chatbots. Okay, AI challenges, explaining the result, like Katie was talking about for the solar panels. There's no transparency, and when... A AI is kind of like a three-year-old child. If they don't know, they'll make something up and they'll say it with a beautiful straight face, right? Because they just don't want to say nothing. Um, lack of context, dates, metadata, supplementary information. That's a great article, by the way. Um, and then my favorite article on the next page. Um, I think everyone's heard of the Dunning-Kruger effect. When you're a student, even when you're an adult, even when you're a specialist in a field, you may not know what you don't know. So whenever I've used one of these uh, bots because I want to try and save myself time, I end up arguing with the bot. I, I recently had to write summaries for 75 uh, middle grade books. And I kept on saying, no, you've missed the point. You've missed the point. That's not, what I, that's not what I'm looking for. That's not what I want to say. But why can I say that? Because I've read all 75 books. Um, give a student or even another adult or educator who hasn't read the books the same thing, the same information. They won't know what's rubbish and what's true. Um, how to overcome this for students and how to overcome this for educators and for, with professional development. This um, archived article from 2010, it's a four article series, the best article ever on the Dunning-Kruger effect. Okay. 
And then these are just, um, so how do you talk to students to say what to trust? And these are two books, they're more librarian-ish books, um, but verified. Uh, Mike Caulfield and Sam Weinberg um, come out of, oh God, what's it, this, the Stanford History Project out of California. Um, and the how to think straight, get duped less, and make better decisions about what to believe online. And the knowledge is a feeling. Again, it's a librarian book, but this guy is saying that if you, like, if, if we were having, you know, a trivia a pub quiz here, and if I said to you, who is the eighth president of the United States? I don't expect many people in the audience. Now, if I said, would rate, does anybody here know who the eighth president of the United States was? Okay. But if you did raise your hand, okay, I think it was Martin Van Buren. I didn't know it when I first heard this, this example. Um, but but it's the thing, if you really, really knew it, you would know it almost in your gut. It is embodied cognition that you say, oh, I definitely studied that. And sometimes you have to think back, how do I know that? And so it's learning to trust yourself, to go back, to get a sense of how certain am I. So if you just go to ChatGPT and ask an answer, you might go, it'll be a very shallow feeling in your body. Right? But when you ask your parents you know, something that you know they know cold and they give you an answer, it's quite a strong sense of... of uh, when J.F. Kennedy died or when, when yes. people stepped on the moon because they were there and they were feeling it and experiencing yeah. it. And then the thing of triangulation, you know, that's how you don't just go, you know, the whole, um, in the old days librarians would say the, uh, what was the thing, the tick list, the... Um, the crap test, the crap right? Test. And you would just look on the page and you'd have to tick, when was it written, who was the author? And now, and that's what that, um, the Caulfield and Weinberg, they start about lateral reading, that you need to get off the website and go and see what other people are saying about the website, because you, they could be looking, um, you know, they'll make it just look authentic, how easy it is to be deceived. And so triangulating the truth, triangulating the knowledge that you're finding online. Okay, um, critical thinking, and again, back to this thing, when you don't know what you don't know, or you don't know something, it's very hard to think critically about it, and, and if you look at the current election, what's going on, right, and people are fact-checking, and people are fact-checking the fact-checking, and um, how do you teach people to be critical thinkers? So I asked ChatGPT, and they came up with these things, um, different types of ways of teaching people critical thinking. Um, but often you do need to know things before you can think critically about them. Um, uh, just a few cautionary and one optimistic tale about <laughs> ChatGPT. Right, the environment. Um, I don't think it is known just how bad for the environment. You know, people making a huge fuss about Bitcoin and being bad for the environment. ChatGPT is bad in a, in a 10,000 fold um, way. So it's really, really bad for the environment. Uh, you can read a couple of articles on that. This is the, the danger of the, um, when AI is outputted as a threat to AI itself, and this, this loop of the snake eating its own tail. And as this, um, so this article that was just in August in the, um, I think it was in, yeah, the New York Times, saying, um, as they trawl the web for new data to train their next models on an increasingly challenging task, they're likely to ingest some of their own AI-generated content, creating an unintentional feedback loop in which what was once the output from one AI becomes the input for another. And this is like the blurry JPEG. And it just gets blurrier and blurrier. And I made me think cannibalism. I thought back to mad cow disease, right? A mad cow disease in the UK started when they began to feed animals the infected brains of other animals. And you create this ecological and Just nightmare. another thing that's just struck me now is um, you also have this bizarre scenario in schools where teachers create assessments using chat GPT and the students answer the assessments using ChatGPT, and then the teachers grade the assessments using um, AI again. So you have this self-contained loop which hasn't involved anything, any input or output from teachers or students. Yeah. Um, of course, the data has value. We all know that. We know that if something is free online, it's probably your data. You are the product, right? And so now this thing to be aware we are very near the Air Force Base, I know. <laughs> um, so the fact that AI companies are gathering data and they're optimizing models to reproduce representations of that data for profit. And, and this is a really big you know, concern 
that um, you just, we need to know, like search engine optimization, huge business, right? Well, the next huge business is AI optimization. And it's just going to be how to get those chatbots to get certain products up in the top results. Uh, Lena Khan in the US have been talking about regulation, um, this thing of uh, should governments be regulating it? She makes a very strong argument that, say, the US government should start regulating it, and not only because of deceptive practices, but also because these AI tools, they're being trained on huge troves of data in ways that are largely unchecked. Because they may be fed information riddled with errors and bias, these technologies risk automating discrimination unfairly locking people out from jobs, from housing, and key services. Um, yeah, one positive, changing minds. It has been shown, and maybe this is because you're not um, arguing with your uncle Fred over the Thanksgiving dinner table or whatever. Um, chatbots have been shown to help people shift um, their minds in political or other um, things through dialogue. So maybe it's because it's less threatening. So as we end up, because we've been given the 15 minute warning, that must have been five minutes yeah, ago. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So of course, we've done a lot of research around this. We spent a couple of months kind of throwing articles at each other and, and reading and doing things together. Um, if you're a teacher librarian in particular or an um, educator, this is a really interesting kind of case study of one librarian in one library and the various tools she cha she's trialed with her students and where she ended up at the end. Uh, few really great books. Um, Barbara Oakley again recommended a few. AI 2041. So when I was in China, this came out. And I read this with my uh, grade 8 students. We had it on our core library. At the bottom here, we, um, myself and the tech um, person wrote a libguide. And what we took, it's 10 scenarios from the future. And it's co-written by somebody who's a tech person, ex-president of Google China, um, ex-Microsoft SGI and Apple, and uh, Stanley Chen, who's an author. So they combined the kind of technical with the uh, writing a story, an emotional, or 10 emotional stories, story followed by how realistic the story is uh, and will be, how close it is to us. And then what we did in our guide is we basically took each scenario and then looked outside what's really happening in the world and kind of found parallels in the world for that. Um, so that's that. And then just because we librarians, and isn't it funny, all these books are red. <laughs> it's like, is AI red? Is the color of AI red? Um, just a few um, books through history on um, AI that we'd recommend. And then these are some of the people. So Gary Marcus in the US, he's a professor emeritus of computer science. He is a, a very big skeptic. So if you definitely want to read that side of the argument, somebody who's very skeptical of it, go read Gary Marcus. Leon Furs was that Australian academic um, I mentioned. Barbara Oakley is the professor of the science of learning. Ethan Mollick is a professor, I think, at the Wharton Business School. And he has a very good substack. He's, he's and his book, Co-Intelligence, a five minute warning. Um, Benjamin Riley, who we mentioned earlier, we really like him. He's an um, educator, cognitive, yeah, resonance is his. The AI pedagogy project out of Harvard. And then this teaching critical AI literacies explainer. That's a, a, like a living document, meaning it's a Google Doc that's constantly being updated. And that's by a lot of those first year university writing professors in the US who are really looking at um, ways to, to get their students to write and to use AI to help them. And, uh, yeah, we're both doing the Barbara Oakley course at the moment, and it's, it's really good. It helps you think. You can experiment if you pay a little bit. These are the ones she recommended, so um, great, usually great courses, um, really well structured as well. And this is her amazing, this was from her slide deck in that talk, where she just puts up the major um, models, she talks, you know, breaks them out by type, and uh, yeah, fascinating, because then and she says, yeah, go out and experiment and get a sense. I like the way that she's mapping it, because then this is, again, like a metaphor in the way that we're going to think about what's what. Yeah, so I use Pika, just go on, Pika for our slide in the beginning with the video. At our school, we use Magic School, which is very specific for schools, which also means it has certain privacy um, things built in. 
And on this, I just put this in because this is the next thing that I really want to try. There was something called Power Notes, which is a Brenda Brusegaard, if you go back to that teacher librarian and you watch her talk from June. And so Nadine wrote to me and said, like, let's look at Power Notes. But Power Notes, it's kind of a, you know, there's a free version and a premium version, but now Google's just come out with this Google Notebook. And so you'll upload, you can upload different documents and have it within one space. And then there's a bibliography, and then we have the slides. And look, we're done before they even told us we're done. Some questions now, so anyone who has any questions. Thank you for this insightful uh, presentation. I was so much looking forward to this one for a couple of days. Uh, my question to you guys is, as adults we know, that we go to chat GPT for anything and everything nowadays. As simple as scheduling and understanding, uh, getting a one hour video crisp and summarized. But when I see my grade six son asking me, why can't I do that? I want to have a very logical, I don't know how do you put that. Uh, uh, what would be your guidance in that conversation between him and I on using AI? I would say to him, okay, let's use ChatGPT. We did this with our grade eight social studies class. So one class, they had to look for something and um, the teacher said, okay, use ChatGPT. Go, go and look it up, all of you, look it up in, at ChatGPT. And at the end of the lesson, as the debrief, it was, you know, what did you think? What was the result? And um, one of the students summed it up beautifully. He said, it made me stupid. So the minute you say don't use it, they're going to want to use it. So I'd say let them use it under guidance and make sure you're feedbacking. You know that whole behavioral and affective side of it? That's super important because, you know, you're dealing with young brains. So you say no, they say, okay, I'll get around it. Sorry, so I just want to piggyback off of that. Um, I think what really helps is to to give an example of how ChatGPT made me look stupid. And so, and I would bring it up here, and, and for NLF we were doing some research and I, ChatGPT just came on, it was very exciting, and so I wanted to talk about, I was looking for a particular kind of person for, uh, for the event, and I went to ChatGPT and I asked about them and they gave me a full history, geography, biography, you name it, on a particular individual who really does exist, but it was a hallucination. She does nothing in the field that I was looking uh, to, to use her for. So in, in that space, in the NLF space, I was looking really stupid. So I think it helps more by example than it does um, to just say it's not the best tool always. Uh, thank you for the talk. I think one thing that stayed with me as you were talking today is a question of not optimizing for efficiency in everything. And there are places where you have to be inefficient for you to be able to learn. I think that stayed with me. As you're talking to kids uh, and in your own experience, and I have a 14-year-old who's actually emceeing this uh, session, are they able to see the differences where they need to be efficient and places where if they're efficient, they're going to become stupid? You know? And are there places in learning where maybe efficiency is what you're looking for? You know, just making a better PPT and not spending too much time on it, as opposed to you, where you have to be inefficient. I don't, ha I don't have any good examples off the top of my head, but I think as time goes on, I'll be collecting them. And, and of course, it's, I think the calculators is a really good example, right? I, uh, my mental math isn't as fast as it probably was when I was 12, and I'm very dependent on it. But then there are other times when you just curse, you think, why can't I do this on my own more? Why am I being so dependent on this machine? So... Yeah, we had a unit recently with our grade sevens and they were researching the five pillars of Islam and the teacher wanted to, I'm thinking Grecian urn in the back of my mind, but at the end she wanted them to write a little picture book for students and then they would read about what they'd researched and then they'd read it to the grade four students. And um, I just had to zip my lips because it was a teacher I hadn't worked with before. I was really, really grateful she was using the library for the first time. I was glad she was trying to do research in an innovative way. Um, I talked to, she's left the school, there's another teacher coming in and I was talking to him about it and I was saying, you know what, we need to do that research and then 
they, they need to be graded at the research end point, and then they can go and use Canva or generative AI or whatever to make the picture book and do that fun thing of reading it to the grade fours. So then I'm like, okay, make them spend 90% of their time doing the research and 10% just using AI to come up with something that looks nice. Um, so that, that's where I'd say the combination of fast and slow. Hi, I think it was a good, good. talk. Oh, the, did someone oh, else? Right, no, right, right. Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, all right. It was a good talk, and uh, I think it's really time for us to pause, rethink as to how we're going to incorporate AI into our um, probably getting to our next generation and where they're going to go. But, but going through your slide, there were a few points which I was looking at, like, say, polyglottism. You just touched about it, I mean, multilinguistic aspects of it. We do a word search, we get lots of meanings, but the interpersonal connect that comes across, maybe not. Maybe what I meant probably would not have been what I said. And there I think AI definitely takes a step back. And how, how do you think we should be going across with that part? My language teachers hate AI. <laughs> I mean, I can't say anything more. I, I, you know, I think, yes, it's fast, it's efficient, and it's inaccurate. <laughs> okay, is that the end? Yeah. That's yeah, that's uh, the that's end. That's the end of the session. Thank you. Um.